good day, dear people. So, this is something a little bit different, I'll admit. I've never actually done a question and answer video on this channel before, but it's been quite a while since the last upload and I don't see the next one coming for another couple of weeks. So, last night I put some questions out on Instagram and YouTube asking people to ask me anything they wanted. But in the meantime, I'm sat in a spot that may be quite familiar to a lot of you. It was actually here that I shot the water bowl video with Jack. So, whilst I'm talking to camera, I'm gonna try and keep an eye out for any sort of movement try and learn a bit more about what they do at this time of year because I've never been here before in the month of October. I'm seeing this. Okay, this my... pan slowly because it's very pixelated. If you keep walking, it gets really muddy, but if you keep walking, you will see me. There's no other turns. It's just follow that path now. Okay. All good. I'll see you in a sec. Right, see you in a bit. So before we dive into the questions, that was my friend Abby, who's actually working with me on a lot of the upcoming projects on this channel. Um, she's actually recently picked up a A7S 3 and today is the day that she's going to test it out in low light. And as you can probably tell by the clouds above, it's, it's the perfect conditions to do so. So she's going to be joining us in a second, but we'll be off camera. So the first question I'm going to answer is from the lovely patrons of this channel who really help to keep it going by paying for things like petrol and... Hello! Oh, Hello! Welcome, welcome to the oh, area of beautiful. sitting. Beautiful, look at this. Look at that. It is actually really nice. Really good spot. <laughs> Spent hours here. Oh, hi GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> hi channel. Anyway, whilst Abby's saying up, I'll answer the first few questions from the lovely patrons of the channel. You're gonna have to part with me just chatting waffle in the background. The first one comes from uh, Karen Busby, my mum. It's a great place to start, I think. <laughs> Favourite wild animal native to the UK? Stoat, love a stoat. Absolutely love a stoat. Uh, hard to see, awesome animals. Yeah, every time I see one, it's just a thrill. But yeah, any sort of mustard lid really, but stoats, it's stoats in particular. If you had to start all over, with gear, what would you buy and in what order? Oh, oh. Um, I'd probably buy a 15600 and then some sort of DSLR crop sensor or full frame. I wouldn't really wouldn't really mind which, but I think that's kind of your vital your vital pieces of gear when starting with wildlife photography. And then as soon as possible I'd get a tripod and a gimbal. I put it off loads when I started, but it makes such a difference. It's so much easier. It's so much easier. If you could only visit one place in the UK to photograph for the day, where and why? One place. Mull, I think, Mull. So they've got otters and then if you're really lucky, they've got all sorts of birds of prey and other amazing marine life that you might get a chance to see whilst you're taking photos. And it feels properly wild up there. So yeah, probably mull. But that's out of the list of places that I've been to, so I'm sure I'm sure you may know of a, a better spot. That's a puffer going from the background, by the way. <laughs> okay, I don't know if that can be picked up, but if it can, that's amazing. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a bucket list shot in mind? All the time. Not a singular bucket list shot, but the amount of images that I've got in my head that Yeah, because they what they do is they chew the bottom of the stem and then they'll like pull it down. Yeah. And of course the top like moves loads. Yeah. Took us ages to figure out why they were so loud. <laughs> anyway, do you have a bucket list shot in mind? Yes, I do. Loads. No specific individual shot. Um, it's, it's more a case of seeing different things on telly or when I'm out and about and thinking, oh, I could put my own spin on that and I could I could get I could get a shot doing it like this or I, I don't know there's no there's no real individual shot that I want like I say but a lot a lot of different ideas that I can visualize very vividly and I'm waiting for the opportunity to to put it into practice and unfortunately I can't give any examples because I think a lot could be replicated and a lot of them I kind of want to discover how to do it first on my own and then I'll share it with you guys. You can replicate it to your heart's content if you want to. 
Right, on to the Instagram questions. I will say, some of you have asked very similar questions, so if I don't answer your question, it's because someone else asked a very similar one. Canon or Sony? <laughs> I wish that was on camera. <laughs> I mean, you were just going... <laughs> <kind of, laughs> well, I'd say it depends what for. For stills and for wildlife, I'd say Canon. And I think for video, Sony. Yes. I'm getting a nod from Abby. That's been that's been allowed. <laughs> Best budget lens for bird photography, uh, the Sigma 150-600. Can't be it. I think it's like 700 now. I'm just cracking. It's a 600 mil, pretty sharp lens. And if it's not sharp enough, just creep it back about 50 mil, and you're fine. Why are you so stupid? That was my mum. I thought the same. So. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd say it's in the genes. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, how much do you miss our date nights? That's from my old housemate, Yusuf. <laughs> we used to watch films uh, through lockdown and for some reason called them date nights. So yes, I do miss them, Yusuf. I miss them very much, even though we spend about two hours deciding what film to watch in the first place. Dream camera and lens combo. Stills wise, probably this. But I would like a 400-2.8, I think. 400mm 2.8, or a much lighter 500mm f4. <laughs> um, for video, well, that depends on your budget, doesn't it? Are you talking consumer level? Are you talking the, the reds and the... Um, I'd probably go for video. For video, actually, for what I do, a GH5S, and then adapting one of the big Canon lenses. Um, just because of the crop factor, it makes such a difference for wildlife. Uh, but I'd have to get some sort of Atomos on there, I think, because the screen's very small. Favourite animal to take photos of? Any kind of mustelid. Oh, badgers. Oh, badgers. Foxes are cool. Oh, I feel like these aren't really answering the questions, but they're great questions. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to go with stoat at the moment, even though I, I really don't get much of a chance to photograph them. That or something super, super, super common, like a pigeon. Because it often means you've got to do something that hasn't been done before in order to get a photo that you're happy with, that feels unique, that feels interesting. So I'd like the challenge of photographing something super common. But stoats, stoats are cool. Species I'd like to photograph, UK and abroad. I think a large mammal of some kind, probably like a bear. What's quite funny is I feel like I'm just answering this to all of you watching the channel, but Abby sat just in my eye line, and so I can see her reactions to every question I answer, whether it's a nod or it's a, or it's a oh, I'm not sure about that. It's really hard not reacting to her reaction. It's quite funny. I've got quite an expressive face. I'm well, learning so that. Even though it's really I know, so I'm like catch me some reflections. Like, oh. Are there any bean bags I'd recommend? No. But not because I don't think they're good pieces of equipment, but because I don't happen to use them for what I do. I'm very much someone who is used to using and enjoys using um, a gimbal head on a tripod. I think if I was um, living and working in Africa, for example, where you very often shoot from a car, then I'd have a lot more experience and knowledge to share with you, maybe. <laughs> but fortunately, no, I don't, don't have any to recommend, but that's not because I don't think they're pretty good. Any hidden or unknown spots that you're able to share? Uh, hidden and unknown. I do have to be careful on this channel because like I said before, people will quickly share the information and, and, and possibly damage any wildlife that's there. But what I will say actually is a beach back home, I'll insert the name once I've checked with my mum what it's called, but it's where I went and recorded um, the video with the waders. If you go there and lay down flat and are happy to be disturbed by quite a number of dog walkers, you can get waders like uh, turnstones and sandpipers and uh, name another wader. I can't think of a really common wader. What's it called? Little white Dunlin. Thank you. <laughs> um, you can get all sorts of those coming right up to you. 
and it's it's brilliant actually i love it uh, beautiful scenery great colors great chance for some really interesting photography um i can't remember the name but like i say i'll put i'll put the name below so yeah that that's the one spot i can share that i don't think is at too much of a risk of disturbance do i still work at the camera shop currently yes that is all and <laughs> Are you planning any more YouTube videos? Yes, this one, as you were. Why is corn so cool? Corn is um, a great vegetable. Is it a vegetable? I know veg there's no such thing as a vegetable. Look that up. You think I'm mad, look it up. Do you know this? No. There's no such thing, scientifically speaking. They're like this weird made up thing. So it's just like a slang term, vegetables. It's a slang term, yes, <laughs> it's a slang term. Um, also, I'm aware that that's my friend Cornelia asking that, but corn, corn is cool. I don't know why. Um, you'd have to ask yourself that, Corn. Um, one technique you want to give a serious try, in-camera movement, light painting, other. I've never really been interested in in-camera movement. I don't know why, but light painting definitely appeals, but I find that's quite tricky to come up with a a scenario in which you could do that with wildlife, but usually means that there's great potential for it. The one that I am gonna be playing with a lot in a few videos, and actually in the next one that's due to be uploaded after this one, is multiple exposure because I think a lot of the time it can look really tacky and not that great and often really easily created and manipulated to an overly polished extent in post and in Lightroom and Photoshop and things like that. But I think doing it in camera and doing it with a much more specific outcome in mind could create some really interesting images and I may have a slightly successful result to share with you, but you'll have to let me know about that one. When did I start learning photography? Well, I got my first camera when I was 18. Different members of my family bought different aspects of it. So someone bought a lens, someone bought the camera body, someone bought the bag and the memory cards. Um, it was lovely and I, I haven't looked back since then. But prior to that, I learned recently that I used to, um, I have no memory of this, on family holidays used to basically pinch the uh, disposable cameras and use them all up in one day that were meant for the entire family and <laughs> meant for the entire holiday. So you could say I started then just with practice. Favourite shot I've taken? I don't know. Favourite shot I've taken? I'm going to have to have a look at my Instagram and remind myself. Um, probably my badger shot. Not the most popular, not the best looking of shots. Um, but I worked hard to get to it and it was a first and it, go away mozzie, and it worked out exactly how I wanted. So probably that uh, badger shot, yeah. Favorite type of photography, wildlife. Um, <laughs> could you be convinced to visit Zimbabwe? Yes, I've got some awesome stuff, why wouldn't I? <laughs> if someone's paying for my trip, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> um, can we head out for a shoot one day? Yeah, sure. Drop me a message. Um, what's your dream career path? God knows. It changes daily. Um, I definitely want to be doing YouTube for uh, for the rest of my life. How major part it plays career-wise is kind of up to you guys. <laughs> how, how many of you watch? How often you watch? Um, patrons, things like that. Probably YouTube long-term, but I don't want to look back and regret not trying to go professional camera op because that's what a lot of us grow up watching right and that's where there's an opportunity to learn so much and to deliver your skill set at the highest possible level i think yeah i, w I want to camera op for sure but the answer to this question is it's tricky <laughs> Should we invest in a 15 years old professional telephoto or more recent semi-pro? Ooh. Ooh. 
<lacht> Habs ist Köln. <lacht> hm. um, semi Pro. The reason being um, the motors eventually wear out and if it's a professional lens like this one, they eventually stop making the spare motors. And so you can basically be using it one day, the motor give out and then that's your, your lens gone. Um, so definitely semi-professional, especially if money's tight. Uh, do you ever shoot film? Uh, I used to, and it's just quite expensive and very hard to do uh, in general compared to digital, but very hard to do for wildlife. But I do have a plan to shoot medium format film for a upcoming video. Would you be up for a meet and come see wildlife on a sewage treatment site if it's possible? Yes, that sounds cool. That sounds very cool. Um, wildlife anywhere like that sounds like a chance for unique photos and that's what I'm all about. Where should I go if I have to visit one green thing that Bristol has to rival other cities next weekend? Absolute help. Oh, like a green space? It's this green thing. So environmentally friendly, I assume. Or green space. To be honest, the only thing that's jumping to mind is Eastfield Park, but it's, it wouldn't really be anything that I think it's got over other cities. Although there is an owl on the island, which is quite cool. I don't know if that answered your question. I'm really sorry, but I guess Eastville. Most memorable sighting. Most memorable sighting would probably be behavior specific rather than the species. I once found myself in between a um, blackbird and a sparrowhawk. That was fun for me. I guess not for the, for the blackbird, but we, me and a couple of friends climbed to the top of a hill. And when we got there, um, this blackbird flew at us. Can you hear that? As I was saying, when we got to the top of the hill, this blackbird flew at me um, to the point of probably the distance to this GoPro. And uh, it sort of banked, went around me and started darting between me and my friends. And shortly behind it was a sparrowhawk that tried to chase it between me and my friends. And we, we just stood there as it was trying to evade its, uh, its predator. So it was one of those moments where you really, really got to appreciate the fragility of nature and just how finely tuned everything is and how like one wrong wing beat or, that's quite a sentence, one wrong wing beat or one wrong turn and it's over for the blackbird or perhaps on the other hand, one wrong turn and the sparrowhawk doesn't get a meal that night, so. Yeah, that was amazing. How do you select locations to photograph? You kind of can't with wildlife. <laughs> you just got to follow every lead <laughs> and hope that it ends up being a good one. Um, though if I'm searching by myself. Oh, it's at that stage where shapes start looking like the animal you're waiting for. Anyway, yeah, in terms of selecting uh, places to photograph. Like I say, it's, it's a case of following every potential lead and just checking out every location that you can. But if I have no leads at all, then I'll probably look for wildlife corridors using Google Maps, which are like areas that connect to habitats, um, that or bodies of water. But to be honest, nine times out of 10, it's just listening to friends of yours and, and, and looking online and just keeping an ear out really. Who was it that got you into photography and into wildlife when you were young? Photography, no one really. My mum was very much responsible for getting me into animals and wildlife and taught me to ride when I was young because that was her passion and her love. Um, so yeah, that was a very big influence. And then I remember we always had lots of pets like guinea pigs and things like that. And when I was about six or seven, we built a pond in the garden tiny tiny little one but it got absolutely crammed with frogs within the first year and yeah I remember being fascinated by that um so yeah my mum very much got me into animals and wildlife and I don't know where the interest in filming it or photographing it came from but two years ago my mum revealed that a relative that I never met my great granddad I think used to make films in his garden of like spiders and things like that, like old school films. And when we looked at a photo of him, he was wearing effectively the same jumper I had on. <laughs> and it was creepy as hell. But I guess, I guess creepy is the wrong word. It was, it was a bizarre moment. 
So yeah, I guess some things just skip generations, but there you go. Will I consider traveling outside of the UK once restrictions lift? Yes. There's many places I want to go. Um, it's just a case of whether time and money allow. What are the most challenging aspects of doing wildlife vlogs? Unpredictability, by far. You can have it in your head that you want to get certain shots and follow a certain storyline so that people watching find it very engaging. And then you get there and the wildlife decides otherwise and you just got to roll with it. <laughs> How do you keep from scaring off an animal as you get into position? Any tips? Yes, and move very slowly. Do your research before heading out to try and photograph it. But most importantly, watch the animal as you move because it will tell you when it feels uncomfortable. Um, if it's washing, it's usually a sign of feeling comfortable, but that does vary slightly depending on the species. But if it stood still, then it's watching to see if you're a threat. So at that point, you don't move at all, whether it takes a few seconds for it to carry on doing what it was doing or a couple of minutes, you wait for it to tell you it's comfortable. For example, eating, like these animals are around us at the moment, tells me that I can carry on talking. Um, it's a great example. I don't know if it's being picked up, but there's munching going on all around us, so I can carry on talking and it's not going to upset Abby because she's not going to miss any shots. <laughs> Should I buy the D500 or a mirrorless camera? If so, which mirrorless camera? Just my hobby in brackets. Very good question. Um, for wildlife, D500 for me. Um, one of the best wildlife cameras out there. Uh, and when it comes to wildlife and stills, you're very up to... Look there. And when it comes to wildlife and stills, you're very often looking through the viewfinder. Now, the specs and all that that mirrorless cameras often have to offer is great. Not a problem with that at all. But if you're sat for a long period of time looking through the viewfinder, an electronic viewfinder can really start to, to make your vision feel a bit weird and give you a headache in a lot of cases. Um, just because you're staring at one or two individual pixels when you're looking for a specific bird that's quite far away or, or any other kind of animal really. Whereas with sports photography, landscape photography, portrait photography, you're looking at much bigger subjects, so it's a lot easier on the eye. Um, so yeah, definitely D500 for me. Can you show how you edit your images? Yes, I should probably do a video for that. I will, I'll do a video about it, but long story short, I wing it each time. <laughs> I do, I don't do presets, I don't have a particular plan, I just turn up and go, all right, let's see what we can do with that. And then, toggle until you get it. mate, toggle until you get it, that's, that's literally, <laughs> That's literally it. Right, a couple more, and these are from the YouTube post, and then we will call it a day. Well, I will for the Q&A, and then I shall join Abby in trying to photograph the elusive but loud waterfalls. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one on YouTube. Boring equipment question, but what piece of gear would you say makes your photography easier? Just stepping into the world of bean bags and gimbal head, so far a little overwhelmed. Gimbal above everything. Just don't even, just don't even, it's not in the same league in terms of the rest of this, this thing. Oh, it's yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. Love it. And I'm not just saying that because Abby's not using a gimbal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw it look, I saw you going. Oh. <laughs> very different because Abby's shooting video. So very different, but for stills, definitely a gimbal head. Um, and then the, the lens cover, to be honest, has very much saved me in a lot of scenarios, but Tripod, gimbal head, that'll get you going. To be honest, it's one of the very few things I'd recommend going to places like like Amazon. <laughs> um, because you can get really, really cheap ones. And for some reason, all of the ones available in the UK are several hundred pounds, or at least those that I've seen. At this point in time, what has been your most difficult urban wildlife for you to find and photograph? May I also ask which of the urban wildlife do you find most interesting? So, uh, which has been the most difficult to photograph? I think Abby probably knows the answer to that. Um, even though it's a species that I have photographed very easily in the past, um, but it does allude to a particular, particular project that Abby has helped out with um, that is ongoing and proving quite tricky to get the final shot, shall we just say. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't reveal anymore. May I also ask which of the urban wildlife do you find most interesting? Urban wildlife, interesting. Anything that I think people think can't be in cities. So like uh, otters are in a lot of cities. 
most people would have no idea they're there, but they're a relatively large mammal. Um, so yeah, anything that I think can live in a place so full of people and yet be in the larger part, at least, completely undetected. I think that's pretty cool. I think, I think you've got to tip your hat to that. What would you say has been your greatest wildlife photography experience to date? Wildlife photography experience to date? Um, mull. It's got to be mull. That was, that was a, yeah. I don't know if it particularly came across on the, on the video itself, but at one point, genuinely without exaggeration, and you can ask um, Charlie and James, who will be linked below, whether this happened, but one decided to swim basically towards me along the shore and was, it broke my, my minimum focus distance on this lens, which is 4.5 feet. So it's less than 4.5 feet from me. And it knew I was there, looked straight at me, and it was just comfortable in my presence. It wasn't really habituated. It just knew that we weren't a threat. And so just carried on about its day. And I watched as it, it caught various items from under the waves and it was one of those magical moments where you just get to be at one with nature, document it, and know that you haven't disturbed it or affected it in any way, which is incredibly rare these days. Uh, what books on wildlife slash photography have you most enjoyed, found most helpful, um, can be practical or philosophical? Which is the best UK identification bird book? The Collins ones, I can't remember the exact name, but I will cut to a clip that I film at home. And then as for other wildlife books, I'm actually really enjoying the book by Chris and Megan at the moment. Um, Back to Nature, I think it's called. Um, I'm not a massive reader. I really struggle. I'm sort of one of those that gets to the end, gets to the end of a line and forgets what the start of the line said. So it takes me a while to work my way through a book. But the Back to Nature book, I am really enjoying because it works well in nice chunks for me. What is your editing process? What programs do you use? Any plugins? No plugins whatsoever. I use Lightroom and that's pretty much just it, apart from the occasional use of Photoshop for a little bit of cloning something out, but I very rarely do that. And I also use Photoshop for focus stacking, but that's, that's very rare. To be honest, Lightroom's so powerful, I don't, I don't really see the need to do anything else these days. But yeah, that brings the Q&A to an end. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that brings the Q&A to an end. So I hope you enjoy. Like I say, this is more of just a filler video at the moment. The usual style of content... Go away, Muslim. The usual style of content will be back uh, next week, I think. Should all go to plan, which I think it does because it's all recorded. It's just a case of compiling it all now. So yeah, thank you for bearing with it despite the big delay between videos. And I hope you enjoy the video. And I'll see you again soon. probably can't really see me, but you may just be able to make out in the sky above. There's a bat flying around. <laughs> so I'm gonna pack up, uh, but we wander over to Abs over here, which you probably can't see. I just, yeah, to be fair. Still going strong in the dark. <laughs>